Hey, good afternoon, teammates. Dennis Lamaster here, and I'm joined by the world's greatest physician, Dr. Najee Pearson. Thank you for joining that is us. That's so kind. Thanks. Again. And, and we're going to talk to you about a number of things today antigen testing, reestablishing the, uh, the bubble, the safety bubble from our trainee population, uh, return to the workplace, and, and then it take, we'll take a couple questions from you as well. But uh, it's good to see you again. We had a break from last week due to the Martin Luther King uh, four day holiday but it's good to see everybody again uh, before I before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Pearson um, she's going to talk about a number of things which we're doing with the force health protection cell which she has established uh, and and has done a really good job of, of disease surveillance in our population uh, but I'll, I'll leave that to her in a moment um, if you weren't able to join us yesterday for the Martin Luther King uh, observance. We had a great venue. Our guest speaker was Dr. Renee Watson of the San Antonio Martin Luther Thing, King Commission. Uh, and it was an opportunity to honor his life and his legacy. And so for those of you that had a chance to, to dial in, thanks for doing so. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the EO office from the 187 Med Battalion and putting this uh, event over. Uh, but Hey, just, uh, just to kind of give you an update, you know, we've done some antigen testing, and the testing was to help uh, get a sense for uh, the, the prevalence of, of COVID in our population who went on holiday block leave. So each student got two tests. Uh, we had roughly uh, 3,000 or so students go off on, on the holiday block leave. We did over 8,000 tests. Uh, and we had a 3.3 positivity rate. I'll let you all do the math, but that is really, really low. And, and really what this is, is a, it's a success story. And what it gets to is just validating, you know, our Army senior leadership's decision to ensure the fact that across uh, training and doctrine command that uh, our, our soldier population that is training could take holiday block leave because they knew they were disciplined and they would make wise choices for the two weeks while they are away with their families. Uh, and I was very proud of the team uh, for, for getting after the, the antigen testing, and more so I was proud of our soldiers' discipline uh, while they're out on holiday block leave. It was excellent. So with that, I would like to hand it over to you, Nadia, and for your opening comments. Thank you, sir. So I was extremely proud as well um, I'm going to start with my team, the Force Health Protection Team, that uh, I particularly couldn't do my job without all of them. Uh, today I just wanted to highlight we had some 68 kilos that were tasked to us to help with the antigen testing. Uh, and these are, anybody that's tasked to us is embedded in the units. And so these folks um, came to us and they stepped it up. Uh, and they did an awesome job. So Sergeant First Class Magnuson was the NCOIC that was in charge. And then we had uh, several of our kilos, uh, Master Sergeant Carrera, Staff Sergeant Bosley, Staff Sergeant Cunningham, Staff Sergeant Patton, Sergeant First Class Strauss. And there was many others that were involved as well. We had two providers that were on hand for 24 hours um, for that whole first weekend for the uh, integration. That was uh, Captain Schultz and Major Promotable Gonzalez as well. So thank you. Um, if you know them, thank them. Uh, they were incredible help. Major Logan has been working with me as my deputy, and she as well has done an awesome job with her team. The movement cell as well helped to coordinate a lot of things through our G3 office, Captain Brown Johnson, uh, Major Baronello, um, and the whole EOC team uh, was an amazing uh, help and getting this push uh, through. So I just wanted to go over just a little bit about our force health protection uh, plan that we actually actioned. Uh, it happened in uh, about three different phases after they got back. The train up before they went, uh, execution uh, during holiday block leave, and then after when they came back with the reintegration plan and now back into the classrooms. So before HBL, there was a lot of information that we put out to the units about how the soldiers can protect themselves and their families. So all that education that happened on the back end from the units before they went out. Um, also a great thank you to DCOM and the um, team who produced the graphics. We had an amazing uh, information card that was distributed 
to our students and also was available to civilians in cadre that had all information on COVID, had contact numbers, what to do if you got sick at home. Um, so that was, um, and also had some uh, tips on there how to make your holiday safer in order to get our soldiers back here and, and continue the training mission. Um, the CG, uh, sir, you and uh, the CSM sent out a letter uh, to all of the family members that was available to kind of describing all of this stuff and also wishing everybody happy holiday season as well. Um, and you did it, um, helpful to maintain our bubble uh, there. So during holiday block leave, all of the students, um, as we can see from the outcomes, uh, did and maintained discipline while they were at home. Prior to returning, uh, we had uh, self-screening ongoing and some people tested positive as expected while we're at home. But they notified and we isolated and quarantined at home and I believe all but one is back now training. So that is excellent. When everybody got here, um, we had a mission set up at Evans Theater where we greeted everybody and everybody had screening. Uh, that was where we had the provider stationed as well if they tested positive. Um, they were taken from there. Uh, if they had any symptoms, weren't feeling well, they were immediately tested by our testing team and our 68 kilos that were available uh, all weekend. We staffed that all weekend. Um, and they were immediately, we did quarantining isolation of that and then everybody proceeded to their ROM. 14-day ROM. So during that the 14-day ROM time, that's when we conducted the antigen tests. Um, they did not start until the end of the first week. We had to establish the point of care lab here and there was some administrative stuff that we had to do that first week. So we were able to get in two tests, um, not the three tests. However, um, you know, when you do it at the end, we did, you know, talk to some people about that as well. So we are pretty confident and in addition to that, sir, we screened drills, cadre, so all the people who are coming back inside the bubble to reestablish that. So they also got all those testing. So again, I am super proud of my whole team, what we accomplished, um, and now we're back at it. We're back in training, sir. What, would you be willing to describe a little bit of what the antigen test is? Yeah, absolutely. So it is a very quick test. Um, it is done in the front of the nose versus the back of the nose and it's a Q-tip. Um, we insert the Q-tip in and we swab five circles on each side and it's a little card that we insert this Q-tip inside the little card into the area where we um, place a developer on that, close the card, and then 15 minutes later, uh, it'll either be one line, which is negative, or two lines, which is positive. Very similar to other tests that are done at home. Um, I do want to point out that our point of care lab here, sir, we are actually um, putting in the information into the medical records here, so they will be available, um, and we're reporting those as well. As part of the soldier's history. As part of the soldier's Wonderful. history. The first ones, we did do backup PCR tests, so everybody who tested positive did get a, a standard um, PCR test going forward that may change a little bit. So I got to tell you, I've had a, both the PCR test and the antigen test within the last week, both negative results, but the antigen test is, is much more pleasant to experience than the PCR test. Yes, sir. Right? All right. So, um, hey, let's move on. Any before, I, did I cut you off? Anything else? No, sir. That okay. was um, right. what I wanted to cover. I just want to make sure. So let's, let's talk about uh, the vaccination plan uh for the department of defense and you may be you may be tracking out there that arnold schwarzenegger has received his first shot uh and this is a big deal uh and he recommends that we get it and so arnold's always a good example to follow i think but the department of defense has laid out uh the the prioritization of those who are going to receive the vaccination uh and i'm just going to kind of touch on some of these um, and, and get a feel for this. And I don't know if we've posted this anywhere, uh, but we probably ought to, and I'll ask, I'll ask that we do post it so you get a sense. This is, I believe, the second edition, uh, and, and so it will change and it will evolve over time. And so let's dive into this. As, as we're aware, you know, the new administration is, is, is really gonna uh, uh, ramp up the, uh, 
The vaccination program nationwide and DOD is, is lockstep with that. But if we look at you know, the phase one personnel, the one alpha personnel, uh, we're talking those tend to be our providers, our nurses, our clinicians, um, healthcare support personnel. Uh, and right now, JBSA uh, is really working through that population. As you know, we've got a very robust DOD uh, healthcare system here, and so they're still working. They, J, they, BAMC, Wilfrid Hall, whatnot, is still working on through its its one uh, uh, A population. Um, and then you start looking at at one B, uh, and and really that's about folks who are getting ready to prepare uh, to deploy overseas. Uh, those with our strategic uh, deterrence uh, forces, homeland defense forces, frontline essential workers. Uh, people greater than 75 years old, so this will, our, our retiree personnel will fall into this category. Uh, and then we start moving down into 1C. Uh, and this is the group, the group retirees uh, age 65 to 74. Um, and then uh, those who have increased risk for severe illness. Uh, and then we're starting to look at uh, those who are in field activities, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, key essential personnel as not uh, identified otherwise in one of the higher tierings, and then phase two, char phase two uh, which tend to be kind of where we are right now with our trainee population. Uh, and, and so this is, this is the truth as it exists today, may change, uh, but what we've done is we've been working with, we've been working with uh, uh, the authorities here, our north and BAMC to get you know, our drill sergeants and our instructors pushed into the into the uh, uh, the one Charlie population uh, because they have interaction with the students and are going on and off post. Uh, but uh, we'll post this uh, and make sure you have access and, and refer to it because I, I just went over some wave tops and it goes into much more detail. Uh, it is not, it is an unclassified document so that we can share that. So uh, just, to, you know, I had the shot uh, a number of weeks ago. A Sergeant Major had the shot. Uh, did not hurt, and I didn't have any, you know, usually when you get a, feel sh a, a flu shot, you kind of feel achy or queasy afterwards. Uh, I did not, and I think I even feel the needle go in, so I look forward to the second shot, and I hope, hope that all successive vaccinations in my life are as painless as that. Um, so I feel good, and we'll continue to report on how the second shot goes, but what would be your comments on this? Yeah, no, I, it, this is an amazing effort and endeavor. Um, we are working closely with BAMC, and AR North is a proponent right now for uh, organizing for all of JBSA. So we will follow suit when uh, we're really at the limitation of getting more vaccine at this point. So our population here is a little bit uh, different than maybe other COEs because we have very large hospitals to support here. So we have to make sure our healthcare providers and everybody at BAMC and at Wolford Hall are also vaccinated first as the frontline uh, providers there. But we do encourage everybody when it's your time, when it's available, absolutely get the shot. I got the shot, um, and it was at the end of December when I got called from the emergency department uh, that it was my time uh, to go in, and I have gotten, the, received the second shot. Um, I will say I do get a little bit sore with influenza shots, and I experienced much of the same. So at the vaccine site, it was a little bit sore just for a day or so, and uh, that was it, and after that, I've gotten the second vaccine now, and it was pretty much the, the same uh, experience as the first vaccine. Um, so I'm working with DCOM and Medvid TV. We're producing uh, additional COVID busters uh, to talk about myths associated with the vaccine and things that you may have read about or talked with friends, family, um, myths associated with this vaccine. Um, but I believe it is safe, it is effective. I've seen the literature supporting this. Um, and I just wanted to say that the, the way that it was made or produced and researched is exactly the same way every other vaccine in this country has been made. Um, but normally those, you know, those locations, those businesses, uh, research centers, they're only focused on uh, vaccines part of the time, but they have a whole array of things that they're working on. So because of the public health emergency, 
all of every, all, everybody really dropped everything and started working on this one thing. So the accelerated process, yeah, absolutely, there was an accelerated process, and that is fantastic for news for us. But it was accelerated not because we skipped steps, but because we put the resources, the manpower, everything that was needed to get what was uh, to be done, done in that appropriate time frame. So get the shot. Um, please post some of your pictures getting the shot. I posted mine. Sir, you posted, posted yours. Mine. And we're going to have this campaign, and you have yours, sir, as yes. well. Um, we're asking everybody to post a picture like this. It says, uh, get the shot, I got the shot, and put in there your reason for why you got the shot. So to protect myself, my family, my teammates, my squad, and your And reason. protect my squad. My squad. And everybody's my squad. All you right. too. Okay. So I hope that helps alleviate some of the information uh, about vaccines and their safety and efficacy uh, at this point. So I'm happy to take any information, questions, concerns. Uh, you can put it in the text here or send something to DCOM. Um, and then please look for those COVID Buster series. Um, we've already recorded several of them, so they should be out shortly. So we be looking for them and tag them, please. Uh, hashtag COVID vaccine. So we look strategically about the shot. It's, it's as many people as we can get vaccinated, the better off we're gonna be. Uh, and there's gonna be a number of reasons why some folks won't get vaccinated. There may be a vaccine shortage somewhere. Uh, there may be some of those who refuse to get the shot. And, and those, are all, those are all reasons why. Um, and what we're going to do, anticipating some of that, um, that we are, we, once, once we get down through the tiering process, through the prioritization, and we start working into our workforce, um, we are going to identify those folks who need the shots, you know, by name. But we're going to have a first up and a second up. So if we have a soldier uh, or civilian teammate who's feeling ill or who says, I don't want to get the shot, there's going to be a number two and a number three. So the bottom line is there will be an you know, X number of vaccines available we want none of them to go to waste. And every human being which we can vaccinate, we are going to create a strategic effect that will be good for the overall health of our population. So I encourage everyone to get the shot. Um, it, it's, about, it's about being healthy. Uh, and, and right now, uh, uh, our leadership across DOD has all had the shot. And I am not tracking any ill or adverse effects. We will continue to keep you informed as we progress through the vaccination period, uh, and we look forward to your questions. So, uh, you know, we may have some today, but we will definitely dedicate some time next week and the following week and so on uh, towards the vaccinations. Um, so what I'd like to do now is talk about uh, return to the work, workforce plan and, and uh, just kind of touch on some things and renew some guidance, which uh, I have put out. Uh, but as you know, uh, Joint Base San Antonio on the 4th of January went from, from uh, uh, HPCon Bravo Plus to HPCon Charlie, which kind of restricted things because the state of Texas and San Antonio commensurately uh, saw an increase in the rise of COVID cases. And they wanted to really, they being JBSA, Brigadier General Miller uh, and team, wanted to make sure that we did not see similar trends in the military community here uh, across the Joint Base. Uh, and, and, you know, commensurately, uh, we had a return to the workforce plan, uh, which, you know, cut to the chase here, we really haven't made any alterations to, because I'm pretty confident that it's a sound plan. What I need is, is buy-in from everybody, uh, and support from everybody, and that, and that is both supervisors and those being supervised. <laughs> And I'm, I am one who's being supervised as well. My boss just happens to be in the state of Kansas. Uh, but everybody, we are all part of a team on this. And so let's just kind of review uh, uh, the bidding here on what we talked about. So, you know, we continue to execute uh, liberal use of the ad hoc telework policy, which is in effect through the 31st of March, all right? Uh, and then I will probably uh, wager that uh, we will extend that beyond March as we approach the end of that month. 
Uh, and so let's, let's talk about what it is. So we know from, from a health, force health protection perspective, we can't have any more than 50% of the occupants of an office be in that office because we just want to make sure that we maintain uh, a physical spread, a distance between, between um, uh, personnel in there. Um, some other things. Um, yeah, and I've told supervisors, you know, just be, we've said 50%. What, what I can't have is this does not mean you have to have, this does not mean you have to have 50% of your staff working. It means you can have no more than that. So if you're still accomplishing the mission and your employees, your teammates still feel safe, if you have 1%, that's okay. If you have 0%, that's okay. If you have 49%, that's okay. If you have 52%, that's not okay because you're 2% over. And I need, I need for you to understand that. Um, employees, I'll say it all up front here and I'll, and I'll just want to be crystal clear. Uh, supervisors, there needs to be a dialogue between both of you as to what the concerns are. We've got to balance mission and we've got to balance the health and also the concerns. Uh, the emotional concerns uh, are what I'm really really kind of focused on because we're taught we have, we have science and then we have how people feel. This policy is also to address how people feel. If someone feels that they are being pressured to come in the workforce but they don't feel it's safe, I really don't think that they're gonna be fully productive at work. And if they feel they're more productive in a telework capacity at home, then maybe that's where they need to be. Here's what I'm gonna say, and I've said this a number of times and I think I've been consistent over time. No one is being forced to come in from a telework uh, posture if they need to be, all right? Now, we kinda, up in the command suite, it ebbs and flows. Uh, and I notice it throughout the building, it ebbs and flows. Um, supervisors, if your employee is just very, very concerned, they don't feel safe coming in and they are productive and just as productive in telework, let them telework. Conversely, we may have some folks that are very productive in a telework posture, but they want to come in because they need the human inter interaction. Let them come in, all right? Even if it doesn't get to the mission, the uh, criticality of, of mission uh, essential. Um, I just can't have offices be more than 50% occupied. That's what I need. And I'll say again, if a teammate feels if they are being forced to come into work, they should not be forced to come into work. You can't be forced to come into work. If someone's out there and they feel like they are being forced against their will, that's an email to Mr. Harmon, to the chief of staff, to Mr. An Doctor, excuse me, Dr. Anderson, or even myself, and we'll go ahead and adjudicate this. I think much of this, because we're all responsible adults, much of this can be alleviated just through a dialogue between supervisors and their employees. There will be a times where we need to come in and work perhaps, and there will be times when we really ha can have a more reduced physical presence in the workplace. But let me remind you, over the last year, the list of all the accomplishments which we have had, um, and I'll talk about them and just as I make my concluding remarks, but we have really moved the dial the Medical Center of Excellence, all of you in continuing the mission with a minimal number of folks who have gotten sick. And that's attributable to your discipline and your commitment. And I'm exceptionally proud of you. And Najee, would you have anything to add to that? No, I, I mean, I think you stated it very eloquently, sir. Um, there are, you know, some things that we're looking at. Again, we look at the downward trend, uh, the 14 day trends, positivities in the communities. But I also want to put a plug out for us uh, here in the workplace and probably all other workplaces. Since we've been doing this for a while, it's been, oh gosh, we're coming up on a year here quite soon. Uh, the workplaces have become pretty safe havens. Uh, so if you look at other places in the community that we regularly visit, grocery stores, pharmacies, and whatnot, um, they also have implemented um, certain force health protection measures. However, the in and out traffic for somebody like at my local grocery store uh, is pretty considerable compared to the people that you work with in the closed area here. So if you do choose to come back, 
um, in, into the workplace and maintain that less than 50%. Just know that this is a safe place to come to work. Um, we have installed all those force health protection measures as well as physical barriers, um, things in the offices. You know, we've confirmed the HVAC system, all that stuff, things uh, that, that put together and also consider that some people are starting now to get vaccinated as well. So that will also start balancing out and hopefully we'll be at a point, um, ho hopefully soon, but we'll see with the vaccines that people can come to work and we can, you know, go back to some sort of normalcy. So you've been at the forefront of tracing for those who have been, who's tested positive, both whether yes, they're military or whether civilians. And, and could you comment, have, have many of those who have been positive, have they traced back to exposures on post or has it been predominantly exposures off post? Could you, could you give us a sense for how they're tracing? Yes, sir. Um, we do a lot of contact tracing and talking to soldiers to try and figure out where our points of failure are. Um, the one thing that we are seeing with contact tracing with people who become positive or who are positive is they, they have an exposure where they were unmasked around somebody who was also positive or somebody who also had symptoms. Um, whether that be in the house, um, because we have many people who are teleworking only and have never been here who also turn up positive. So that means that that happens somewhere in the community, at a doctor's office, at grocery, at, you know, wherever people are going with their day-to-day -day life. With the contact tracing, it always comes back to, I would say, more than 90% of the time, an exposure where I let my guard down and I wasn't wearing my mask and I thought my friend was doing the right thing and they called me and said that they were positive and they may have had a gathering at their house or went out and saw a movie with a whole bunch of people. Um, so that's usually the point of failure, sir. Yeah, so I'm a believer in this thing. Like I said, I just traveled to Florida here uh, last week and, and uh, uh, came back and had two different tests and both negative. Um, my experience on the airlines uh, was that the airlines are really doing a lot uh, to make sure that folks are wearing the masks, uh, hand sanitizing, all of that. Uh, so I think we're in a good place with regard to keeping the workplace as low risk as possible. Not zero risk but at a lower risk than outside in the community. So having said all that, our mission continues. And we've done a, a mil just a great, great, a great job. Uh, to give you some numbers, you know, I, I, we just started resuming uh, shipments of AIT graduates uh, yesterday. Uh, we'll let you know when we cross the 10,000 threshold. We're not there yet, but we're very close to it. Uh, but, you know, here, so the last 44 weeks, uh, when, since we've been operating under COVID, uh, we've graduated over 17,500 students in over 750 courses. So what that means to the Army, you know, to readiness, to the Army, man, that's, that's 17 and a half thousand. So that's, that's physicians, that's nurses, that's physicians' assistants, respiratory specialists, combat medic, lab techs, and many, many more AOCs and MOSs that are now practicing out in the force. And again, it's because of you and your discipline uh, for making sure that we have kept the spread at a minimum here with this formation and we've been allowed to continue our mission. All of this gets to an operationally ready army, which keeps our adversaries at home. So with that, Tish, what would be the questions? Okay, sir, ma'am, because of the interest of time, we'll go ahead and take a couple of the live questions. And the first one, ma'am, I think is for you. Um, so they're asking about the vaccine effectiveness against virus variants. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so right now there's ongoing research. Um, everybody has seen in the news that there are some variations or variants uh, of the virus. It may have mutated a little bit uh, over time, which is a normal occurrence. So when they make vaccines, 
they aim to make them at one of the most stable components of the virus towards towards that stable component so if the vaccine or if the virus excuse me mutated that stable component is still effective when they make the vaccine so right now they're seeing really good efficacy against all of the variants um, and we hope it stays that way Thank you. Can, can I ask a follow on yes yes sir. so what level how much protection does someone get if they've had just one of the shots so there are several different vaccines that are out there there are two that have emergency use authorizations that's Pfizer and that is Moderna they're both made very similarly it's like you know two different brands of jeans or something if you know that you wear so as far as the variants or the you know the variations um, if you've had one now these two vaccines require two shots there are some that are being researched that will only require one so hopefully those are coming soon if you've had one with both of them you can estimate about 50 percent efficacy as far as the protection level you'll get after the first one it's really after you get the second booster shot um, about a week after the booster you'll have up to the 94 95 percent efficacy uh, as far as protection from that and that's excellent compared to some other vaccines that we normally have, like the influenza vaccine. Um, yeah. So one week after the second shot, 94% efficacy rate. Did I say that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Cool. What else, Tish? Okay, sir. And last one, again, in interest of time. Um, so the, in reference to the phases for the vaccinations, um, there's a question about those students who are in courses like the CCC but they are maybe healthcare providers um, who will be immediately transitioning to inpatient care, you know, when they return to their home duty station. Is, has that been considered as part of yes. the plan? Okay, ma'am. Yes, so the vaccine plan has been considered for all of that. So with that course, we've had several students uh, that have arrived already having one vaccine. So we're, we only have the Pfizer vaccine here on the military side here, um, backing it up to begin, when they get the counseling, when they receive their initial vaccine, one of the criteria for receiving the vaccine is your availability three weeks later to be able to get the second vaccine. So again, this is all new to us. We're working out the kinks um, and trying to cover those people who have come to us that have had the first vaccine to get them the second vaccine. Unfortunately, we don't have the Moderna one here to address that. Um, when we get to the phases, and again, we're limited by the amount of vaccine that we have received so far, not necessarily the distribution of it. Um, when we get to that and they're vaccinating people who are here, again, we'll have to take into consideration if we get that vaccine and you cannot, um, because your course ends next week, we may not be able to give you your first one and we may say, go start your vaccine series um, when you get to the first duty station and help arrange that. Again, these things are in flux and they will change as we see the numbers of vaccine that get distributed to the distribution points change. Um, I think the plans would be a little bit different if we had a million doses of vaccine to hand out right now, time now, um, but that is not the case. So again, look for the, those directives and when we get the information from our North, we will we will over communicate that to people in terms of what the plan is. Thank you. Yeah. And so, sir, any closing remarks? Okay. Closing remarks? Yes, sir. So, um, when the shot becomes available, please be on the lookout because, like I said, we will over communicate that. Please, please, please um, prepare to receive that vaccine. Um, recall the uh, Get the Shot, I Got the Shot campaign. That's going to be really fun on social media uh, to do that. Yep, we got our little signs here. So re remember that. Um, and so as far as, you know, why are healthcare providers recommending the vaccine? There's tons of reasons why we're recommending the vaccine and we're getting the vaccines ourselves. So number one, to protect yourself, your family, your loved ones, your military teams, your communities, your squad, and our nation. Uh, it's part of our duty to protect our nation, and this is one of the things that we do with vaccines. Number two, these are highly effective, at least the two that have emergency use authorizations, highly effective as compared to even other vaccines that we normally give. 
Um, number three, um, although majority of people have mild symptoms with COVID, we have zero idea of what the long-term complications are gonna be if you had a mild illness. So we don't know if it's gonna affect brain function five years from now, 10 years from now, or it's gonna be a resurgence uh, you know, of neurological complications or something like that. So uh, long-term complications we don't know about. Get the vaccine. Four, people with pre-existing conditions have higher risk. But quite honestly, we don't know who those 20% of the people who will get sick and die from this virus. It's kind of a crapshoot right now, so we don't know. Um, protect yourself um, with this vaccine. Number five, the combination of vaccine and forced health protection measures until everybody, until the vaccine permeates into the population is gonna be necessary. So it's part of the overall plan to get back to normal after we get everybody vaccinated. Um, number six, um, the vaccines are absolutely held to the same safety standards as every other vaccine that's out there. There was something in the news uh, several years ago, many years ago, about some vaccines causing autism. That was absolutely disproven um, and does not, there's no correlation with that. And uh, there were some issues with the data collection on that that were noted. The scientific literature was recalled on that. And so, you know, it's a changing atmosphere and, you know, people can make mistakes. And so we're at that. I don't think the way this vaccine was made that this was any mistake at all. Um, and also, last thing that has been in social media has been about allergies and anaphylaxis, which is a severe allergic reaction. Uh, the influenza vaccine is like 1.4 or something like that in a million. The COVID vaccine, now that we've distributed many million, is like 11 in a million. So it's like a 0.001% chance of this, extremely rare. So not something that I myself was worried about and it won't be a consideration when I get my, my um, parents vaccinated as well as my children when it's available for my children. So that's, all, that's my plug on that, sir. Thanks, and I, and I appreciate that very comprehensive lay down. Um, so uh, you, you gotta get the shot and, and uh, uh, it's important um, and it's really, it goes, it, it yields strategic effects nationally uh, and that's what we, why we have to do this. So I encourage everyone to, to seize the opportunity once it becomes available. Um, you know, switching gears here, th this is a lethal disease, and we lost an employee um, last week uh, to COVID, and there will be a uh, memorial service on the 1st of February. Uh, it'll be hosted by 188. Uh, and another tragic loss that sadly we've experienced here at the Medical Center of Excellence, but I encourage everyone to, to participate uh, in that memorial service. Um, you all are very, very, very important to myself and the other senior leaders here of this organization, uh, and, I, and I can't overstate that. Uh, thanks for dialing in today. It's great to be back. Happy Friday. Dignity and respect.